Superhero movies might be the biggest thing at the box office today, and with the kind of epic action that we're getting from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's easy to see why. That hasn't always been the case, though. The history of the genre is full of catastrophic failures that never managed to save the day for audiences or critics, from obscure heroes who were a little too bizarre to household names that had a rough road to the screen. Here are the worst superhero movies ever made. Barb Wire Barb Wire might not be a traditional superhero, but with her over-the-top costume, dystopian sci-fi setting, and roots on the page, she seemed like the perfect comic book character to make Pamela Anderson an action star, in theory. In practice, the 1996 adaptation didn't give the fans or the cast anything they wanted, except maybe seeing Anderson in the leather costume that the Telegraph called unnecessarily revealing. Set in the distant future of 2017, the movie starred Anderson as Barb Wire, a bartender and bounty hunter trying to escape the Second American Civil War by dealing with a mobster named Big Fatso and making enough money to move to Canada. With a premise like that, it's easy to see why Anderson thought she was signing on for what she called a dark comedy about a blonde, big-haired badass riding around on a motorcycle. With a studio demanding changes to the script, a new director, and less humor, however, what could have been a campy classic was tanked from the start. Howard the Duck You might have been excited to see Howard the Duck pop up in the post credit scene in Guardians of the Galaxy, but don't let your interest in one of Marvel's more obscure characters trick you into watching his first feature film outing from 1986. Produced by George Lucas, Yes, that George Lucas, the movie starred Back to the Future's Leah Thompson, giving it a sci-fi pedigree that any movie in the 80s would have been jealous of. Unfortunately, while Universal was trying to get the guy who made Star Wars, they got the guy who made The Phantom Menace instead. What I don't know is, what the hell I'm doing here? After Robin Williams wisely passed on the role, the job of voicing Howard went to theater actor Chip Zine, who knew something was wrong when he had to buy his own ticket to see the movie he starred in. As he later said in an interview, by the time they'd gotten through 111 minutes of a duck puppet's questionable romance with Marty McFly's mom, he and his friend Roy were alone in the theater. Everyone else had bailed. How would you really are the worst? <laughs> Green Lantern With roles in Blade Trinity and Deadpool, Ryan Reynolds has had decent luck with superhero movies. His attempt at bringing DC's Green Lantern to life in 2011, however, risked ruining his career and taking the whole superhero genre with it. After it cost a whopping $300 million to make, about $80 million more than it took in, the scathing reviews and terrible box office numbers threatened to turn studios off the idea of comic book movies altogether. Fortunately for Reynolds and the entire superhero genre, the same weekend Green Lantern opened, he shot the now-famous Deadpool test footage that would convince Fox to give him a shot at redemption. Reynolds took the chance, and unlike Green Lantern, Deadpool was an R-rated smash. Steel Black Panther brought superheroics to Africa and moviegoers into theaters in record-breaking numbers, and Blade kicked off the modern superhero film. But neither King T'Challa nor The Daywalker were the first black comic book hero to make it to the big screen. It's often overlooked, but Shaquille O'Neal beat them both to the punch when he starred in the 1997 adaptation of DC's Steel. Although you can't really blame anyone for forgetting about this downright awful movie, it was so bad that director Kenneth Johnson apologized for it, admitting that he probably should have walked away once he found out who his star was going to be. Shaq definitely had the heroic proportions to bring the Superman-inspired armored hero to life, but lacked the acting chops to save a miserable script that feels like a bad first draft of Iron Man. As Johnson revealed, however, Warner Brothers co-president Bill Gerber opted for O'Neill over the likes of Wesley Snipes and Denzel Washington because he thought Shaq would sell more toys. Considering Gerber was fired the next year, we're guessing the toy sales weren't much better than the movie. Spawn When you sit down to watch a DVD commentary and the first thing the director says is, you can blame it all on me, that's not a good sign. That's exactly how Mark DePay introduces himself in the Spawn commentary. At the time, he was known as a visual effects wizard, but he'd never directed a movie before, and it showed. When Den of Geek revisited the 1997 film, they pointed out that for a movie based entirely around its visuals, quote, a good number of the effects aren't good. Some are flat out awful. As a former staffer at Industrial Light & Magic, the visual effects should have been DePay's specialty, although as far as he was concerned, the CGI wasn't the problem. Speaking to Wired in 1997, the outspoken filmmaker lashed out at censors, claiming, The MPAA is driving a stake through my heart with this, because they're making me take this movie down so much. 
He also called it a very positive story, which is a little hard to believe considering that it's a movie about a zombie superhero getting yelled at by a demon clown. Daredevil Long before he donned the Dark Knight's cape and cowl in the DC film universe, Ben Affleck made his ill-fated foray into the superhero genre with 2003's Daredevil. Despite Affleck's genuine love for the character, the cinematic version suffered from the tonal whiplash of ultra-serious images mixed with goofy action like the playground fight between Daredevil and Elektra and a murderous supervillain whose menacing insanity came off as cartoonish and not in the good way. With a bad script and incredibly awkward visual effects, it's no surprise that critics offered up some unfavorable comparisons to Spider-Man, which hit theaters the previous year. They weren't the only ones. Affleck himself called Daredevil the only movie that he regrets making, and he agreed that the 2015 Netflix version was doing the character far better than a movie that, as he said, quote, never kind of got it right. The Fantastic Four Technically, Roger Corman's The Fantastic Four has never been released, but this low-budget take on Marvel's first family became a thing of legend after bootleg copies began making their way around the convention circuit. The story goes that new Constantine Films contacted the veteran B-movie producer after failing to secure a $40 million partnership with 20th Century Fox. Nobody else wanted in, so since the rights to the Marvel property would expire if a movie wasn't in production by December 31, 1992, Corman was hired to make the cheapest movie he could. God help us. The result was a movie so legendarily bad that it became the subject of a 2015 documentary called Doomed from director Marty Langford. The saddest revelation in that film was that the cast had no idea that they were just making a movie to help secure the rights, and that there were never any plans to actually release it and give a cast of unknowns their big breaks. Look at it! See it! <laughs> Does it amuse you? You can't blame them for being fooled, but they probably should have noticed something was up when they could barely hear Dr. Doom's dialogue over the clanking of his armor. Or, you know, when they saw what the thing was supposed to look like. To be fair though, the origin story in this film is actually more faithful to the comics than in any other Fantastic Four movie to date. Of course, the fact that we still think this one is the worst, even after those other three, should give you an idea of just how bad it is. Catwoman if you watch Halle Berry's notoriously terrible Catwoman movie and Christopher Nolan's Game Changer Batman Begins back to back, it's hard to believe that there was only a single year between them. This extremely loose DC adaptation was nominated in seven categories at the Razzies, and Triumph, sort of, in four, including Worst Actress for Barry. She even showed up in person to collect the award along with co-star Alex Borstein and her Academy Award, and started off by thanking the studio for casting her in what she called a god-awful movie. And that was the nicest thing she said about it in that speech. Rest assured, it actually is that bad. In addition to scenes where Barry's magical cat powers kick in during a basketball game and cause her to swat at the ball like a ball of yarn, it's full of cringeworthy stereotypes for a female superhero. Seriously, Catwoman fights a villain whose big plan is to distribute evil makeup because she's mad that she's starting to look old. In 2018, Barry addressed Catwoman once again while accepting the Matrix Award from New York Women in Communication. She acknowledged how bad the picture was, but she defended her decision to accept the role, revealing that the, quote, load of money she made changed her life, and that the movie taught her what not to do. Captain America After 10 years of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's hard to imagine anyone but Chris Evans as Captain America. Back in 1990, though, Matt Salinger, son of famed American author J.D. Salinger, was tossing shields when Evans was still in elementary school. Originally intended to be released on the 50th anniversary of Captain America's first appearance, this low-budget Marvel adaptation was never actually finished, with the production running aground before the final scenes were shot. Unwilling to send the existing footage to the deep, dark vault that it most certainly belonged in, studio execs had editors cobble together a version that could be released on VHS. Mr. President! Thanks. Salinger later revealed that the film was as grueling to shoot as it is to watch, with his rubber suit causing him to overheat. On top of that, the costume looked ridiculous, thanks largely to the addition of rubber ears attached to the helmet, and the movie's Red Skull was inexplicably portrayed as an Italian mobster, complete with a hilariously over-the-top accent. That was a gun! This is a detonator! Did you really expect me to be taken alive? 
As for the script, well, there's a scene where Cap grabs the Red Skull by the wrist and the Skull pulls out a knife and chops off his own hand. Not exactly the evil mastermind fans were expecting. Condor Man Dubbed an ideological intervention from the Disney machine by Time Out, 1981's Condor Man is a camp cocktail of Cold War spy thriller, comedy, and superhero movie, all watered down for family consumption. This misfire from the Mouse House stars Michael Crawford as Woody Witkins, a comic book creator who insists on doing everything he writes in real life, just to prove it can be done. After accidentally getting involved with a seductive Soviet spy, Wilkins has to become the hero he created, flying and all. For the most part, Crawford himself was in the ghastly Condor Man suit, and at one point, he almost died in it. After falling into a river in costume, the gigantic wings dragged him down and nearly drowned him, making the film unpleasant on both sides of the camera. That said, it's been more than 35 years since Condor Man hit theaters. Maybe it's time to introduce Disney's first attempt at a superhero movie to the MCU. Or not. <laughs>